would like for us to introduce our guest. And Dr. Ray, are you ready to do the introductions? I am here and ready to jump in. Thanks, Kara. So I don't know, it's been since 2005 or so, I started the Secular Sexuality Podcast. I ran it for two years until it practically killed me. And then I was able to fortunately hand it off to the atheist experience, atheist community of Austin. And in the process, um, they, they put together a whole different kind of show. And Christy, our guest tonight, our speaker tonight, was uh, soon after that took over the show. And he has done a phenomenal job. It's, he, he does far better than I ever did when I was trying to do it. So I'm so thrilled to have Christy here tonight. Christy and I've kind of become good friends over the last few years. We met several times. I've been on show uh, a few times, of course. Um, but I think I think uh, the atheist community of Austin and Christy bring an angle to human sexuality that nowhere else on the planet is being, uh, nowhere else does this. Nowhere else looks at the cross between religion and, and sexuality in, in detail and with compassion. And that's, that's what we're about to hear tonight. But let me just quickly say, Christy is a licensed professional counselor in, in Texas. He does uh, all sorts of things in his private practice around gender, sexuality, religious trauma. And uh, he is he has his own practice ca called Valence Counseling. And he tends, he works to normalize, educate, and entertain on the show, of course, and probably in his own private practice, I'm guessing. But, um, but he pro provides support for, for anybody, kink, poly, queer, affirming therapy, no matter what it is, he's there to affirm people. So, Christy, thank you so much for joining us tonight and uh, thrilled to have you here, I'll be taking notes too. I'm probably going to steal some of your <laughs> talk. So. Yeah, well, fair enough. I thank you so much. I uh, I'm actually really excited and and a little bit proud to be here. Honestly, like when I uh, was first called by the ACA about secular sexuality, I had no idea what it was, what it would be, or that I would be here doing any of this with you, good people, years later. So uh, it's really an honor. And we are so glad to have you, Christy. I was so excited when you agreed to come on. Like, can I just can I just tell on myself right now? What when I asked you if you would come on, I like assumed you were gonna be way too busy for this. And I was like, oh hey, Christy, would you ever be interested? And in, I don't know, coming on RFRX. And you were like, I couldn't, I was waiting for you to ask. <laughs> I am so pumped um, that you are here because your work is amazing. I have learned so much from it i love it and i have had the privilege and honor of being able to participate a few times in secular sexuality myself and i am here to say for anybody that hasn't been on there before christy has some some good advice <laughs> so log in and we are so glad you're here so Okay, you have done so much work educating people, um, including myself and many of us here, who may have struggled with all sorts of things to do with religious trauma, to do with dating or relationships after leaving religion, everything like that. What inspired you to get involved in all that? Tell us your story. How did you get here? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I had a tough time coming up. Uh, I was a very lonely person as a teenager. Uh, and I, I honestly thought that it was just because I came from a bad family and I was just a loser of a person. Like that was very much the framework that I saw it all through. And it, you know, it took years and years for me to recognize that like, oh, a autistic queer kid growing up in a small town in a religious environment was kind of always going to struggle through some of those things. But I, I kind of desperately wanted to have somebody to talk to and to eventually be like part of that solution. So at first I, I turned to the church and threw myself as headlong into that as I possibly could. And after a decade of that not really getting me anywhere, I, I recognized that there, was, there had to be something else. There had to be something else to work towards or to be working on. And that led me eventually to like organized atheism and the atheist community of Austin and the activism and, and all of that good stuff. And I 
am so glad it did. That is excellent. And so in addition to that, that's all like your side gig, right? You also do counseling on the side on top yeah, of that. Yeah, no, my, my full-time day job is uh, I'm a gender and sexuality and then also religious trauma therapist. So it does end up coming to play kind of everywhere. You know, honestly, like most any therapist, whether you work specifically with like grief and loss or with, uh, you know, careers or any of these different types of fields, therapy ends up being about just humans sitting in a room talking about their anxiety, talking about their depression. But I've had a incredible opportunity to work in particular with the atheist community, with people who have experienced religious trauma and are kind of questioning, and then particularly with like queer and kinky and poly folks. And honestly, I, I am so happy for it because it is the most interesting population of people on the planet as far as I'm concerned. Everybody that I interact with on a daily basis has uh, just a fascinating story. and everybody has 10 million different like sci-fi or board game recommendations. So, you know, it's a, it's a good group of people to be working with. I love that so much. I mean, you know, I, I knew I'd been getting a lot of good book recommendations from your shows, but now that I know that there's more like sci-fi and board game recommendations coming, I am just, I, I don't know what it is about the queer community and the atheist community, but there's a there's a Venn diagram right there <laughs> yep. when it comes to like LARPing or, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, all, all that kind of good nerd shit. I love that. I can't remember if it was on one of your shows or someplace else because, you know, everything in my mind is just like a giant mush. But it seems like somebody was talking about like there's the LARPing community and there's the queer community and the circles just basically like completely. Pretty overlap. much. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. So speaking of which, you mentioned that you deal a lot with the um, people who may have dealt with religious trauma. If you would like, I can share the results of our opening poll, and it mm -hmm. looks like a majority of our uh, people here tonight may also fit into that category. So I'm going to go ahead and share this, and I'll read them for anybody that's listening to the audio only. Um, the questions were, again, have you ever practiced mindfulness? And 68% of people said yes, 23% said no, and 10% are not sure. Um, similar numbers for, are you familiar with the term self-compassion? 65% said yes, 29% said no, and 6% are not sure. And then the third one, would you say that you have experienced religious trauma? 61% of people here tonight said yes, 23% said no, and 16% are not sure. So how does that strike you, Christy? Those numbers is that yeah. about in line with what you're thinking, or you know, I'm I'm actually gonna I think steal uh, a line from Daryl. Uh, I don't think that we need to think about trauma as like this big capital T type of problem. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if we if we stub our toe, we don't necessarily need to go to the emergency room, but it's still a trauma, right? Like there's still uh, like bruised tissue. And I, I don't think that we need to over, I don't want to say over dramatize, but we don't need to minimize our trauma. And so for that reason, I honestly think that everybody who is alive today has experienced some level of religious trauma. I mean, just by breathing the air that we're all breathing, by swimming in the water that we're all swimming in, you are going to experience some level of that, even if religion happens to have been like a net positive in your life. There, there are still negatives there. And I, I think it's valuable for us all to recognize that. And then, you know, I might pick apart the, the mindfulness idea just because mindfulness is just about focus. You know, whether you practice it or not, if you are doing something intentionally and on purpose, that, that's what we might consider a mindful act. So, you know, I, I might play with some of that a little bit, but these are people's personal experiences. So I'm excited to maybe uncover what some of these words actually mean and, and help people maybe look at it from a different lens. So, and I am so here for that because I wrote these questions probably poorly. So please feel free <laughs> to pick those apart and say what they actually mean. Sorry, Helen, what were you going to say? Well, it was interesting when you were saying that, you know, um, probably everybody has experienced some form of religious trauma or relig religious influence because my husband grew up secular. And when he was in college, he got really into like death metal and he started like, 
listening to like Slayer and Iron Maiden and stuff. And he said that when he was like 19, he looked at the cover of a Slayer album. And if anybody's seen Slayer cover art, <laughs> it's like hell demons and, um, you know, very graphic, like, you know, um, spooky art. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And he had a moment like, is this satanic? And he didn't grow up within religion at all, you know, and he had that moment of that influence, you know, yeah. coming, coming in and, you know, and giving him pause. And then he was like, oh, no, fuck it. It's just music. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I want to be mindful not to water down the term or the idea yeah. of like religious trauma syndrome or, or some of these notions that we're starting to get more and more literature and research around. But if you are a woman or somebody who cares about or has ever loved a woman, then you've been impacted by the conversation around abortion, which is a pretty much a strictly religious concept. So just right there, I mean, right walking in the door, I think we can acknowledge the trauma that comes attached to some of those ideas. So I, I think we all qualify as having had a negative experience from religion, regardless of whether we call that a, a capital T, a lowercase t, or just want to leave the word trauma out of it entirely. That's a really interesting point. I like how you put that, that, you know, it's the kind of thing that might be sort of infiltrating our thinking and our experiences and the things that are happening to us, just whether we realize it or not, just because of the fact that it is so, you know, heavily present and in some parts of the world dominant in in the 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 culture and, and the kinds of the politics and, and everything that's affecting people. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So I know we'll get back into that a little bit later, but I'm wondering if we can actually pick apart these concepts of mindfulness and self-compassion. So I've heard of both of those. I use the Headspace app, which is great. I love it. Um, if you are able to Same. subscribe yeah. to a service, like, yes, I need I that in my life to wake me up every morning. And the wake up, it's my favorite, especially when they have like once a week, the nature one. It's it's great. I love it. Um, but it's always telling me to think about self-compassion. I'm not sure how it knows that I need this, but it does. But um, can you tell us a little bit more about what that is and how do mindfulness and self-compassion go together? What is this, this magical combo? It's not magic. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to try really hard not to like stand up at my pulpit and just deliver the, the lecture because I can go on and on about this stuff. But when I use the phrase uh, mindful self-compassion, I am kind of specifically talking about the therapeutic program that came, comes out of the Center for Mindful Self-Compassion uh, by uh, Kristen Neff and Christopher Germer. Uh, it is a compassion based therapy. So it's based on like the work of Paul Gilbert and a, a number of others, uh, as well as a lot of the research that's been coming out of that center. And it is a particular program that believes that in order to really practice self compassion, you need to start with a sense of mindfulness. Uh, kind of like I was alluding to, mindfulness is really just a, I know it's one of those kind of buzzwordy terms that can get really watered down and finds itself in all of these like bizarre pseudosciencey type spaces and can really turn people off. But really, it's just a, a word that has to do with focus. It has to do with the intention. Uh, Shauna Shapiro, another researcher that I think is really involved in this area, talks about mindfulness being made up of your intentions, your attention, and your attitude. So those three things, if you are working to, uh, on purpose, have a like particular uh, intention or a particular goal while you're working, if you are paying attention to a specific thing on purpose and trying to cultivate like a particular attitude or mood towards that thing that you're doing, you're already practicing mindfulness uh, so, you know, it, it gets connected to meditation and to hypnosis and to, you know, cooking, motorcycle maintenance, like however you want to frame it. If you're doing it on purpose, that's mindfulness. And in order to be compassionate towards ourselves, we have to have a level of mindfulness. Like we have to be present and aware with what's going on because compassion, when you really break it down, is just that idea of being present with the pain, you know, any sort of like big, strong emotion, anything that is uh, powerful and important, 
we tend to often want to push away or discard. Like if we are upset about something, if we're struggling with something, but we have to get through our day, we, we kind of put blinders on and like to dismiss it. And so this program is really about finding ways to be kind to ourselves so that we can have, uh, I guess, the strength of will, if you want to put it that way, in order to sit with some really unpleasant or, or difficult emotions. So um, I have a question. I'm going back to where we're talking about, you know, religious influence, because um, a lot of religions teach to have compassion for others. But mm -hmm. I, but I know from growing Catholic, there wasn't a lot of discussion on having compassion for the self. And being, right, because you, you're a terrible sinner. You, you don't right. deserve it. Right. <laughs> so, um, have you found that when you're talking about um, this topic with people that have experienced those um, religious influences and trauma, that they have a hard time, you know, getting into the groove of learning to be self-compassionate and give themselves space that, you know, it's okay if they screw up and be forgiving to themselves as well. Yeah. And, and that's really what, uh, what made me gravitate towards it, because it is something that is so particularly useful and successful with folks who have religious trauma, because it is so contrary to that, like, take every thought captive, thought policing, uh, sinning in your heart type of mentality, because it actually tells you to turn towards the parts of yourself that maybe you don't like, the parts of yourself that you're ashamed of. If you have, you know, angry thoughts about somebody, rather than going, well, no, I, I can't be mad at them. I, I don't want to think about that. That would be awful. This program encourages you to actually look at those things. Now, you know, listening to those thoughts doesn't mean obeying those thoughts, but you have to bring a little bit of presence and a little bit of awareness to them in order to, well, in order, A, in order to actually do anything about them. But even before that is a step of just being present with them. And oftentimes that is the thing that is missing in order to let those thoughts go. You know, we, we get angry at our partner because they, you know, drank all the coffee and didn't uh, refill the pot. And we tell ourselves, well, I, I'm not supposed to be mad at them. And so we shove that thought down and then it just kind of lingers in the back of our mind. I mean, trauma and pain can be stored in the body in some really fascinating ways that we're just now beginning to understand. And by bringing some awareness and some presence to those things, Oftentimes, that's all that's necessary to actually let them go. Wow. This, as you're describing that, it reminds me a lot of several of the conversations that we've had before about when people are talking about, particularly in religious contexts, trying to stop having lustful thoughts or, you know, stop looking at porn or, or whatever mm -hmm. it is. And it's this idea that if I just convince myself that I shouldn't be having these thoughts then you know pray hard enough they'll go away but it sounds like you're saying that's not the path at all that's yeah doomed to failure yeah I I, I don't want to get sidetracked going into yeah. a whole uh speech and lecture about quote porn addiction I, I know that uh you know that's kind of Daryl's territory I'm sure he's talked about that with y'all plenty of times but it is worth noticing that the uh, percentage of people who identify as quote porn addicts are much 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 more likely to be religious and it's in large part because of that shame cycle which whether that is by accident or by design is a large part of why the god virus continues to operate and evolve and uh, and propagate because when you feel terrible about something you're kind of prevented from really thinking about it and really doing anything about it. And so you end up making the same mistake over and over and over because rather than tending to the issue, you deny or dismiss or disavow, uh, resist and avoid that issue. It's like the thing where people say like, don't think about the pink elephant. And all you're doing <laughs> is thinking about the pink elephant as soon as somebody says that. And you'll it's hard to do a don't. Yeah, it's, it's very hard. <laughs> or, and you'll, you might forget about it for a little while. But then it, something will trigger it and you'll be like, oh, now I'm thinking about the pink elephant again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's what a, a lot of mindfulness really is, is just recognizing that it's OK to have a, quote, bad thought. But as soon as you catch yourself maybe being distracted by something you didn't want to be distracted by, you find yourself obsessing over something you didn't want to be obsessed with 
just sort of gently bringing your attention back. If every time you meditate, you are trying to like focus on your breathing and you just, you're noticing that anchor, you're watching your uh, breath go in, you're watching your breath go out, you're watching your breath go in. Well, naturally the default mode network within your mind is going to kick on because it's bored. When your brain is being underutilized, it's going to do other work. It's like uh, one of those supercomputers that like rents out space at night to, you know, calculate uh, the number of stars in the universe and all of these kinds of things. If there's bandwidth that's not being used, your brain is going to start to apply it to something. And so we get caught in all of these sort of weird loops where we find ourselves like drifting off into other thoughts. And we get mad at ourselves for it. We beat ourselves up and we say, oh, how hard is it? I'm only meditating for five minutes. How hard is it to just focus for five minutes? And then what we're doing in that moment, we're not practicing meditation. We're not practicing mindfulness. We're not practicing uh, focus. We're practicing getting angry at ourselves. And that's why so many people try to meditate for a week, get frustrated and give up. Because instead of meditating, instead of like practicing mindfulness, they're really just practicing being angry at themselves. And nobody likes that feeling. It's not good for you. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't feel good. And do we really need to practice that? I, I feel like we don't need practice at that. <laughs> yeah, plenty, plenty good at it already. I'd much rather focus on other <laughs> things. So, you know, when you find yourself in that moment and you're focusing on your breathing and you notice yourself thinking about the empty coffee pot, instead of yelling at yourself for it, you just sort of gently remind yourself hey, it's okay to focus on something boring right now. And that gentleness is the, you know, part of the compassion within mindful self-compassion. Stop yelling at yourself. Just gently remind yourself that you want to do something a little bit differently. Wow. I yes. feel really called out in a very compassionate way. Right. Now. <laughs> I, did too. I thought I was uniquely bad at meditating, but maybe it's, it's not just me. It's what I'm hearing. I I was going to say on that point, like I need guided meditation because when I have ADHD and my thoughts are like ping pong balls, but guided meditation, um, one also silence gives me a lot of anxiety. I don't do well in, in quiet, but guided meditation really helps me because I'm focusing on the voice. There's usually music, there's usually sounds and that helps me relax better because noise relaxes me. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the that voice kind of takes me out of my brain because that's what adhd brands do anyway like we like distractions to pull us out of ourselves yeah we, so we all that, have monkey mind but uh yeah. folks who are neurodivergent yeah. like myself like my partner like yeah. our kiddo like we all have a slightly harder challenge of turning off that default mode network and really like yeah. cluing into something yeah so like whatever i don't know like I, and I think like I used to beat myself up and like trying to do like silent meditation because I felt like I was doing it wrong or like, and I was beating myself up going like, what's wrong with my brain? Why can't I just relax? And then when I found this new tool, I was like, oh, oh, I just need someone to talk to me while I'm meditating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, and I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we all are hitting on it. So I'll uh, just go ahead and touch on this. When we talk about mindful self-compassion, there, there are really three important components. And we, we've discussed the mindfulness part, we've discussed the compassion part, but that self piece is, uh, uh, is an important part of it. Because so often when we are struggling with something, like Kara said, that they feel like the, the worst meditator in the world and all of this, when in reality, they're just like everybody else. We feel broken and isolated, like there is something wrong about me specifically. And if we can try to move to a place of common humanity and realize that everybody struggles with meditating, everybody struggles with focus and attention, it starts to become a lot easier. You know, I, I talk to all of my clients when, we, when meditation comes up or when we're working on that about how when we uh, set up a meditation, we're trying to make it hard. Right. Like when you go to lift weights, you're not just sitting there with something that you can just like easily move up and down. You wouldn't gain any strength from that. You want something that gives you some resistance, something that's challenging and focusing on just your breathing on something as 
goddamn boring as like your own lungs going in and out just like they have for every minute of your entire life it's gonna be boring and that's by design we are trying to make it hard on ourselves so the fact that you're struggling with it doesn't mean you're bad at it it just means that it's hard and and how contrary is that to the christian or especially like the evangelical worldview that i and, and so many people grew up with of recognizing that just because you're struggling with something doesn't mean you're broken, doesn't mean that you're alone, doesn't mean that you're the only one. It just means that it's a difficult thing and everybody struggles. All creatures suffer, everybody experiences pain. So the fact that you're in pain right now, you know, you're in a fight with your partner and your heart is broken and you're hurting. Yeah, maybe it's because you did or said some things that you regret doing. But the fact that you're in an argument with somebody you love doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you a person. All people fight with the people that they care about from time to time. That's just part of it. So if we can get away from feeling isolated and alone and broken and recognize that, you know what, it kind of sucks, but pain is part of life. We're not like fallen angels. We're just people and people suck sometimes. And that's, by, that's okay. Wow, this is okay. This is one of those episodes where I, I'm realizing I thought I had deconstructed a lot of things, and I'm now realizing <laughs> a bunch of the narratives that have been happening in my head embarrassingly recently are probably some religious indoctrination telling me things like, You're a bad person. It's specifically you, you're uniquely bad. And yeah. I'm hearing you say that's maybe not it. I mean, how, how different would the world be if we looked at our problems as issues to be solved rather than like sins to be punished? You know, I mean, think about how, how different our prison system, our, our criminal justice. I mean, really everything would change if we were trying to resolve these issues rather than punish them. It's very interesting because uh, also um, when you were speaking before, I was thinking of this is that in religion, and I, I was with Kara, I was like, oh, okay, this is something that I do that in religious systems, um, everyone has to pretend they're perfect. They, that they're not struggling, right. that, yeah. you know, they figured it all out. And then if they go to their pastor and say, I'm struggling with my spouse or my job, they, they're just told to pray, you know, and trust in God and not given tools to really help them th with those things. And then as you get older, even though you might learn coping skills and you get better at it, like I deal with this still where I, if I screw up or if I, um, if I don't, if I don't see myself like, you know, fulfilling whatever idea of myself I have in my head, I get down on myself really bad. When mm -hmm. I'm really, I'm just a person doing person things and I make mistakes. <laughs> you know? Yes. Like, oh my goodness, Helen. Yes. Like I am here to tell you if anybody else like me and um, I know one person in particular I'm thinking of, <laughs> I feel like we have the exact background. Um, anybody else that, <laughs> that did the, the whole like Bill Gothard program and all of that IBLP stuff, like literally you were taught that if you are having low self-esteem that that in and of itself is a sin and mm -hmm. you're sinning by feeling bad about yourself. So feel bad about bad. it. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm like, wait a minute. How do I get out of that? Though? <laughs> There's no way out of that in that logic of it. And then well, you're and, feeling and... bad about feeling bad. And now you're feeling bad because they're telling you not to feel bad and that it just turns yeah. into a And if you don't stop, you're bad. definitely going to hell. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, not only does that make life pretty miserable for everybody, but if you are convinced that uh, having struggles, that running into issues, that having problems in life is a sign that you are broken or sinful or whatever else, you're not going to reach very far. You know, you're going to stick to what's very simple and easy. I try to remind people part of that common humanity piece is recognizing that if you're struggling with something, it means that you're bumping up against the, uh, the height of your competence, of your skill set, of what you're good at. If you're not struggling anywhere in life, then you're probably being pretty lazy and boring. Like you're not learning anything. You're not trying anything new. 
if you are struggling with something, it means that you are growing in something. And if we all had more permission to struggle and to fail and to suck, we would do far more. Wow. I, I feel so empowered by that. I'm, I can't <laughs> tell you. <laughs> okay. So I was going to ask you next, and I feel like this question has been completely answered. I was going to say, what are some of the benefits of self-compassion and who would benefit from trying it? But I'm, I'm betting that your answer is going to be, I don't know, everybody? I mean, yeah, I, I do <laughs> think that it, it applies to everybody, that it uh, is something that could be valuable for everyone. Um, I will say that it has been shown in particular to be really effective with people uh, who struggle with uh, body dysmorphia, who struggle with eating disorders, who struggle with anything related to like perfectionism and self-criticism. Religious trauma is something that we don't have a lot of good data on, but I think that I've seen in my practice, it's very effective in that area. Uh, and I guess the only real caveat, and we might cover this a little bit more in a second, but the only real caveat I might give is that some people, particularly folks who have come out of really religious experiences, may feel a little bit uncomfortable with some of the like Buddhist roots that are, are somewhat attached to it. Uh, I don't know that that needs to be the case. But I know that some people may be kind of uncomfortable. Meditation is not like a requirement for this particular therapeutic program, but it is a really useful tool that we tend to lean into. So if meditation feels a little bit too much like prayer, if something with very like vague and well-cleaned Buddhist roots feels too close to religion, I, I can appreciate or respect how that might seem uh, triggering to some folks. Okay. So would you say then that there are sort of a variety of ways that you could engage in this sort of mindful self-compassion? It doesn't necessarily have to be you follow this exact script and do this exact exercise two times a day or something like that. For sure. Uh, yeah, it's like mindful self-compassion, the program and the center and, and some of those ideas uh, are, are used pretty nebulously. Like it's not a, a fixed program. But even when you zoom out from there, it's really just another form of a like mindfulness-based therapy or a compassion-based therapy. Uh, and so there, I think that there's a lot there for, for really everybody. I think also too that um, on that note of you're saying, you know, people get a little bristly if it's like, you know, if it's attached to, you know, a religious context. But, it, but as you're saying, like your body kind of keeps the score and getting people just to pay attention to what their body is doing when they feel stress or when they feel happy or when they feel you know um any sort of emotion you know getting that used to what am i feeling in my body and that alone is a good little practice you know just so you know outside of just you know the meditation part but just getting them used to that feeling of where where am i now you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, that that sort of embodiment yeah. practice is yeah. uh, is another big part of uh, of what we would be working on here. Um, a a large part of what we do in these types of programs is just kind of intentionally and specifically like generate a sensation or an emotion so that you can then sit with that and get a sense of what it feels like in your body so that you can uh, maybe strengthen those muscles, create some neurogenesis by like sitting in that experience and then bring it to mind uh, at another point when you need to. You know, in, in the same way that I can like sit here and talk about a, a greasy cheeseburger with like a thick slice of cheddar that's just the right amount of melted and the bacon is just perfectly crispy with crisp lettuce and a juicy tomato. And like the longer I go on, the more you can start to feel in your body, the memory, the sensation, the feeling of wanting, craving, or thinking about, or eating a hamburger, you can take time out of your day to really experience the sensation of compassion, compassion for yourself, of compassion for others. And you are, I mean, you're creating neurogenesis, like you are strengthening those muscles within your mind, so to speak, and making it a lot easier to then call that emotion up at a, at a time where you might need it. Ooh, okay. Hold on, sorry, I'm 
writing down some some questions from the chat so mm -hmm. oh great good because i'm having trouble editing yeah. <laughs> i know i'm sorry i hope y'all aren't hearing my like very clacky keyboard as i'm typing <laughs> it's new <laughs> no worries yeah so okay that's very interesting i like that and i know we're going to get later on in the show um we're going to ask you to give us some kind of examples of of how people can do this mm -hmm. but um i want to dig a little deeper into you know you mentioned okay some people are are uncomfortable that there may be some you know vaguely religious roots to this or it may feel you know a little bit like praying or things like that but this is something that is also evidence-based, right? Is there is there research about this? What yeah. can you tell us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, probably the the first like meaningful research on this subject would be uh, from Paul Gilbert, and I, I think that that started uh, perhaps as far back as the seventies. Uh, don't don't quote me on that exactly, but in the last ten or so years the number of research articles have just absolutely exploded. Uh, that's in large part because of the Center for Mindful Self-Compassion and the work of uh, Christopher Germer and Kristen Neff. Kristen Neff in particular has been writing books and speaking about self-compassion. If you, you know, watch a Brene Brown TED Talk, she's pro Kristen Neff's probably the first person who pops up in your suggested video feed. Uh, and so a lot of people are getting sort of turned on to the idea in popular culture. And we've got a increasingly gigantic body of research uh, that really uh, that really supports these practices. Uh, in particular, uh, if we have time at the end, I'd like to maybe teach all the, the self-compassion break exercise, which is just a, a five minute, I'm gonna not even call it a meditation, I'm gonna call it like a meditative practice. And uh, the number of studies showing, okay, we taught this to 100 teenage girls. We taught this to 100 college level athletes. We taught this to 100. There's so many studies showing the effectiveness of teaching that specific exercise to people over the course of six or eight weeks. Uh, it's, it's actually really remarkable. Um I have a question. So mm -hmm. I know this is probably taught to children. Is it easier for children to learn this practice than adults um, because of the differences in the brain? Is there any research on that? Yeah, I, I couldn't speak to that specifically. There are some programs that are specifically designed for, uh, for teens and for kids. Um, God, I want to say it's being friends with myself or friends for myself or, or something along those lines. If you just want to Google like teen self-compassion, I, I think it's called friends with myself is the program. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not super familiar with it, but I know that the research is really good as far as a comparison between uh, teens and adults or children and adults. I mean, obviously when you're young, you, you haven't really learned shame and self-loathing <laughs> in the way that you tend to as you get older. So uh, that early intervention is absolutely beautiful, um, but I, I don't know that it's it's necessary. You know, I, I think that this is a toolbox and a skill set that applies to anybody looking for it. I love that. There, there's hope for all of us. <laughs> Okay, so I think I just dropped something in the chat um, that has to do with that. Making friends with yourself, I think. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the name of the program. Yeah, yeah. oh, very cool. Okay, I'm going to have to look all this up later. You're adding yeah, books to my list. To my, I'm going to bookmark <laughs> it so I can read it later because yes. I asked the, the question because I'm nosy. <laughs> yes, and now the questions are coming in hot and heavy, so I love it. Keep them coming. So, okay, let's see. We've talked a little bit about some of the roots of this and... Can we go back a little bit to, you've talked about some of this already, but how does this all relate to religious trauma? How can this help us with our religious trauma per se? Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, we we can tell somebody as they are leaving religion, you know what, you don't need to police your thoughts. That was ridiculous. That's not gonna going to work. And we can explain it to people pretty well. And they go, oh, okay, that makes sense. But you're still going to do it, right? Like it's, it's like your internal bios. This is the like beneath the operating system. This is just the way that your mind has functioned and the way that your mind has seen the world for probably your entire life oftentimes. So to reprogram that, to retrain our minds 
takes conscious effort and a lot of repetition. And that's sort of where the, the meditative aspects of this can come in, but also just practicing that reframe of, I'm not broken, I'm a person. You know, I don't need to avoid this thought that I don't like. I actually need to be present with it. I don't need to punish myself because I'm struggling. I actually need to support myself because I'm struggling. And changing like those three thoughts over and over and over is, I mean, it's a lifelong venture. Like you're never really there, but uh, it, it's valuable for folks who have learned all of those uh, particularly religious lies. Oh, that's great. So it's not like you're good or bad at doing mindful self-compassion. It's like you're just, you're practicing thinking about things in a different way that are probably very different from the way you may have been taught, depending on, on what you grew up learning. Yeah, I, I myself have been trying to sort of develop and, and mature my language a little bit and try and move from uh, a place of like judgment to a place of preference. You know, trying to get away from, well, am I good at this or am I bad at this? And, and stop even worrying about the good and bad and just say, well, I would like to do this differently than I'm doing it today, because if I do it differently, then I will get a different result and I would prefer a different result. So letting go of that judgment for towards mm -hmm. ourself can help us to let go of judgment towards others and vice versa. We become much more understanding, much more accepting, and much more compassionate of other people when we work on stressing those skills towards ourselves. Ooh, so quit doing the same thing over and over again and telling yourself the story that the problem is that you're not good enough. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I like this. It almost seems too good to be true, given my, you know, background in the, you know, it's always you. <laughs> <laughs> it's also too, like, it's, it's, it sounds like so simple. Like we're just people doing people things and we have to practice. Like you're not, you know, the stuff that you need more practice at, you just need more, more practice out in, in the stuff that, you know, like you're a human being, you're going to get angry. You're going to get frustrated. It's okay. You know, um, what you do with your feelings is that that's what matters, you know, and you get, and it's okay, you know, to, to be, to be like, you know what, I, I, you know what, I got angry, you know, I'm going to just own it and feel okay about it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then work on, you know, um, repairing the damage or whatever it is, you know, but it's so, I, especially those of us that have left religion, man, that judge, even when you have done the deconstruction, you've done the work that self judgment just keeps coming in and telling you like, you're bad, you know, you fucked up, you're, you know, blah, 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 you know, and cause we're our own worst critics because of, you know, those, those ideas. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And it really does seem to be, uh, I don't want to say that it's like exclusive to religious people. But when we look cross culturally, we do see that the uh, influence of Christianity and uh, Islam are highly predictive of, uh, so of uh, self criticism, or, you know, inversely predictive of self compassion. And, and is there also research, and it, I don't know if there is or isn't on this, but like, does that tendency towards the self-criticism and the lack of self-compassion uh, tend to produce better outcomes? I, I feel like a lot of times the argument is, oh, well, but you need to be this critical of yourself because otherwise you're not taking personal how responsibility. How will I achieve? Yeah. How will I anything. grow? How will I ever do anything? If I just cut myself too much slack, if I just yeah. let myself off the hook. I, mm -hmm. I think that is kind of the, the most uncomfortable part of all of this is mm -hmm. recognizing that when you were heaping shame and guilt on yourself, you were creating an environment where you weren't going to want to sit around and work on that problem anyway, because it was making you miserable. When we beat ourselves up, we uh, create a lot of anxiety. Oftentimes we use anxiety to motivate ourselves and, you know, Helen, I might even say like this in particular is going to be true of my folks with ADHD because of the way our culture responds to folks who are neurodivergent. Mm -hmm. There tends to be that what we're now calling rejection sensitivity disorder, that uh, idea that, that we are just constantly, constantly, constantly being criticized. And we you rely on criticism 
as a, as a goad, as like a painful mechanism to get our attention and to get us working. And not only is that painful and pretty miserable, it's not especially effective. When we make ourselves uh, really nervous that we're going to fail, we don't try new things. We don't act adventurously. Right. We don't stick our necks out there. And we add on this additional layer of not only do I have to now fix the problem, but I have to fix the problem. And I have to deal with all of the like inwardly pointed aggression that I've been throwing at myself. So now I have to deal with my issue and I have to deal with my shame and my guilt. I have to deal with all of the anxiety that comes from all of that shame and guilt. And now I've got a much, much bigger problem. Uh, to, to put it in, in really simple terms, I don't have uh, you know specific studies directly in front of me. There are a ton of them on my website, uh, as well as if you just go to self-compassion.com, uh, Kristen Neff has a huge selection of uh, research articles. And what they seem to show pretty consistently is that if we uh, offer a self-compassion intervention, and help people to grow in their self-compassion, their bosses are going to rate them more highly. Their romantic partners are gonna rate them more highly. Their uh, children are gonna rate them more highly. As a just general principle, being kind to ourselves is really effective at making us the type of person that other people are going to like and respect and hire and love and marry. Well, this isn't now, just feel good, wooey kind of thing. This, this actually helps people. <laughs> so and it only it. makes sense if, if you think about it. I mean, it's such a, a simple philosophy. It's challenging in a lot of ways, but if you have an issue, why not work to fix that issue? Like, mm -hmm. why do we add punishment? It's not actually preventative. Like when we beat ourselves up, it doesn't make us necessarily less likely to perform that quote bad action like we were talking about with pornography and, and some of these things. So it, it just makes sense, I think, to take care of ourselves. Yeah, you know, that really resonates a lot with me. And I'll, I'll tell on myself again, I was getting ready for tonight's show and I went to Google like mindful self-compassion and went on YouTube and did some exercises and looked at some of the links that, that you had sent me. And um, I, I will completely confess it was because I was procrastinating. I was supposed to be doing some other work and I decided I'll do this instead. And then I was simultaneously feeling bad about the fact that I was being lazy and procrastinating by doing mindful self-compassion, which was a great meta experience. And, yeah, and then, right. <laughs> yeah, I was like, great, let me do this to feel bad about not feeling bad about wait a minute. But anyway, <laughs> I was doing the exercise and I actually did feel better. And in some ways, it reminded me of the techniques that I've learned for doing things like crisis communication, where hmm. And this is also something that I know anybody who's been through our um, volunteer program to be a helpline agent or anything is probably familiar with too, where there's this idea that you have to deal with people and feelings and emotions first before you really try to solve problems or, or do anything like that. Because if you don't, you know, you're not really going to be in the mental space to be accessing your, your critical thinking and your problem solving parts of your brain, right? But so I, what I'm wondering is, would you say this is kind of similar to, to that in that um, it's not that the point of it is problem solving. The point of it is not problem solving. The point of it is being, being kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you do that, is it likely to then produce a state of mind that might actually be more conducive towards problem solving than, than you were previously in? Yeah, yeah, I exactly. Um, you know, uh, Christopher Germer, whenever he speaks, will kind of take a moment at the podium to just acknowledge that he feels nervous and that he used to have a terrible stutter and that he is uncomfortable speaking in front of crowds. And by just saying that part out loud, sitting and being present with it for a moment, he sort of enables himself to be able to, to carry on and to, you know, give the speech. I, I actually worked as a crisis hotline operator for, I think, four years. Uh, so like 1-800-SUICIDE type stuff. 
And I took the, uh, the training for uh, RFR uh, a couple of years ago, like at the very beginning of COVID, I went through the full training, was ready to, to volunteer with you good folks before COVID very much changed my work life and, and everything else. Yeah. Uh, but that, that programming very much matches that idea. Uh, you see this in um, like Alan Frizzetti's uh, DBT work really emphasizes that uh, I think he calls it what the, um, the, the, the relationship two-step or the, the Texas two-step, something along those lines, because you have to start by just listening to and validating a person's yeah. feelings. You have to mm -hmm. summarize them. You have to reflect them back to them. You have to make sure that the other person feels as if you have those feelings, that you recognize them, that you understand mm -hmm. them. And it's only at that point where you've established that, that mindful presence that then you can begin to like move into these other steps. Mm -hmm. And this is something we talk about with um, people that have difficult relationships with their families, like they're deconverting, but their family is still locked into their faith and they want to start shifting them. But, and they feel like, well, if I just present them with facts and logic, they're going to change their mind. And it's like, that ain't going to work. And we always emphasize connect with their humanity first, mm -hmm. connect with their emotions that, you know, I know that you are a loving person. I know, you know, and I'm, and this is what I'm going through and connecting on that level rather than um, attacking or casting judgment. And, we d and we emphasize it to, for people to practice that with other people. But again, we have to, rem we will tell clients like, you know, it's okay. You know, you're feeling these, this feeling it's okay, but doing it to ourselves is a lot harder. Like, you yeah. know, and even with, with all our training, we also can kind of not remind ourselves that you know what like we're humans too and you know and and all your feelings are valid you know and it's okay like you can be gentle on yourself as well yeah a, a thought or a feeling doesn't have mm -hmm. to be rational in order mm -hmm. for it to still have power over you in order mm -hmm. for it to like take up space in your life in order for it to matter mm -hmm. so all feelings are valid and we have to start there before we can start to separate out you know, rational and irrational and, and all of those sorts of things. I love that. Yeah. This is great. And, you know, I feel like it shouldn't be a big epiphany that the thing, the techniques that we try to use with other people, we should also use with ourselves, but <laughs> somehow that does feel like a big breakthrough to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that really is sort of the, the central idea to common humanity. We are so much more kind to other people. If somebody else is late to the meeting, we are going to have such a different relationship with that lateness than we do with our own. And it's because we tell ourselves, especially in this uh, very like individualistic type of culture, this very competitive culture, we always say that we have to be the best. We have to be better than everybody else. You know, I think George, George Carlin used to joke about how something like 90% of people believe that they are above average drivers. How, right? Like the math just doesn't check out. We are all of us just people. And if we can operate from that perspective and stop overthinking it, it doesn't mean we're not holding ourselves to a high standard. It means that we're just recognizing our humanity and prioritizing the right things. Because if we are trying to be the best at everything, we're going to start sucking and slipping at a lot of things. I always like to say that you're... I I'm a special snowflake, just like everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that keeps me humble. You know, that's one of those things that kind of reminds me that you know, like you're a human being too, you know, everybody is, you know, you're special. Everybody's special, Helen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but not everybody is 20%. They're cooler. not. No, no. I'm also, <laughs> Helen, can you confirm? I've been hearing in the chat that this, this may be a thing from my little pony. Yes, it is. It is from My Little Pony. So that's where I got it from. So it was from, it was actually, um, I watched a documentary about bronies that John Delancey hosted and one of the characters said it and I just adopted it as like a little cheer for myself. I'm like, you can be, I'm like, if anyone hangs out with me, you're 20% cooler. If I do something I'm very proud of, I'm like, I'm 20% cooler now. <laughs> so. 
I love that. I thought that was special to you. And in my no, mind, it's no, still No, I stole it. But it, John Delancey <laughs> said it. And if Q says it, it's true. It so. must be true. Fair to say. He is a god on TV and an atheist in real life. So, yeah, so he, whatever he says is true. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Sorry to get us off topic there. Now, okay. Christy, you mentioned that you might have an exercise that you could lead us through? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, the self-compassion break. It is a great way of just sort of encapsulating all of the ideas that we've been talking about. It's a very simple meditative exercise and something that anybody can learn to do. Uh, but when I, when I talk about it with my clients, I, I tell them my own story, which is that for uh, the span of like two months, I committed to, I'm going to do this exercise every morning. And every morning I would, uh, you know, push play on like a five minute recording. Uh, I'll, I'll tell y'all that if you go to my website, if you go to YouTube, honestly, just Google the self-compassion break, you will find dozens and dozens and dozens of like guided meditative recordings that you can practice along with. Uh, it takes about five minutes to do it in that fashion. And when you do it, it's going to walk you through the three elements of self-compassion. And what I would tell people is that I would practice in the morning doing it in that sort of like in the laboratory kind of way. And then I would get dressed and I would put a small stone in my left pocket and then every time I would reach into my pocket to get my phone or my keys, I would notice that stone and it would remind me, okay, I still need to do this in the wild. Because I would challenge myself every day, I'm going to do this meditation like in the laboratory and I'm going to do it once in the wild. And so I would spend all day just looking for an, a moment of suffering, you know, something painful, something bad. When you're starting out, I recommend that you stick to stubbing your toe, getting stuck in traffic, like maybe don't dive into using these tools on a major loss or an area of grief, at least while you're kind of like developing those muscles. But when I would, you know, find myself stuck in traffic, I would, you know, start to get frustrated or upset or angry at myself for being late. And then it would cue this memory. I'd be like, oh, aha, right. I was looking for something bad to happen, so I'm prepared for it. And it kind of reminds us that self-compassion is about being your own superhero. It's about like having your own back and being responsible for caring for yourself. You know, when I, when I kind of tell that example of how to use this practice, people often think that I am encouraging them to just be pessimistic and like always looking for problems. And you might think that that would lead to a really like depressive, anxious, negative worldview, but because you know in the back of your mind, I've got this, I've got my own back, I'm going to take care of myself. Self-compassion is like going to a party where you don't know anybody, but you've got that one friend that you can always make eye contact with in case something goes wrong. And so this, this just kind of strengthens that idea. But the, the exercise itself if you want to, you know, close your eyes, if you want to meditate, if you want to sit in any particular way, you just begin by bringing to mind a uncomfortable situation, you know, something in your life that hurts, something in your life that you don't feel is going right. And then you just label it for what it is. You call it a moment of suffering. You know, and there are a lot of different mantras that people will use. Sometimes people feel uncomfortable with the word suffering. They feel like, you know, suffering is something that happens to starving children. And that's valid. I, I don't want to take our everyday getting stuck in traffic problems and put them next to like the worst of the, what the world has to offer. But I think that there's value, again, in that common humanity piece of recognizing that we're all on the same spectrum, that we're all familiar with the idea of pain, that all creatures suffer. So you, you start by thinking of that painful idea and then just being present with it, you know, allowing yourself to sort of feel that feeling, to think about the fight with your partner and to let yourself maybe get a little bit mad again, like to generate that emotion within your body. And then you move to that, that uh, common humanity piece and you remind yourself, whether through a mantra or through some other idea, Suffering is part of life. All creatures suffer. 
The fact that I am in pain doesn't mean I am, uh, or the fact that I'm struggling doesn't mean I'm bad at it. It just means that it's hard. You kind of repeat these ideas to yourself and then you move into that third step, which is offering loving kindness and nurturance. And oftentimes we'll use phrases or mantras like, may I be kind to myself? May I be at peace? May I live happily and at ease? And you know, you can play with those words. Uh, you can listen to various recordings that'll use different phrases. Once you start practicing, once you've listened to the recording a half dozen times, you'll get to comfortable where you're doing this in your own mind while you're stuck in traffic or whatever else. And you can play with those phrases and find phrases that work well for you. I should say that when we're sitting here saying to ourselves like, may I uh, live at ease? That's not a, a prayer to any sort of magical God or to the universe to come and fix our problems. That's just us expressing sort of a hope and an intention for ourselves. That's setting our intentions and putting our attention on the idea of ease. And by doing that, by cultivating that attitude of ease, we're, we're bringing all of those mindfulness pieces together. So you find yourself in a bad situation, you notice that bad situation, instead of turning away from it, you sit with it for a moment and you label it. You know, this is a moment of suffering. All creatures suffer. May I live happily and at ease. And again, I would really encourage people to practice that through a number of different, uh, you know, recorded uh, guided meditations. But once you have sat with it a handful of times, even if you don't think of yourself as a meditator, it's pretty straightforward. And you will find yourself being able to sort of repeat not just those phrases, but those ideas in your daily life. And I, I really highly encourage it. It's funny. Um, you described what a therapist did to me years ago when I was dealing with a particular trauma. And I was dealing with a lot of the anxiety and pain that came with it. And she was, and I started calling it a demon. And she's like, well, just have tea with your demon. You know, yeah. like, yeah, yeah, just have tea with it. And whenever I, that's a, a Tara Brock phrase. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. But yeah, that's what she said to me. And I, and I kind of adopted it. I still use it now when I'm feeling angry or especially if I'm fighting with someone, I'm like, I need to go have tea with this demon and I need to process mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we'll come back. But, and it's really helped me recognize those intense emotions and, and recognizing that I have to acknowledge it and work through it. You know, so it just made me think of that, what you're talking about, about acknowledging those feelings and working with them instead of trying to push them down and, and pretend that they're not there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, uh, the uh, mindfulness component, mindfulness sort of requires a, uh, a bit of acceptance. And so, you know, that radical acceptance idea of uh, inviting those demons in for tea <laughs> is really, really valuable here because we are taught to run away from our problems. You know, probably the, the best advice I ever got in my life was uh, being like 15, 16, working in a restaurant. My dad had worked in restaurants his whole life. And he told me, go in and find the thing that you suck at the most and then be the only person who does that. And I, I did that. I worked at a deli that uh, also served lattes and because we were a deli, we didn't serve a lot of lattes, so we kind of sucked at it. And so since we kind of sucked at it, we sold even less. And it was this issue where nobody wanted to make them, nobody wanted to order them, but they were still on the menu. It was this whole thing. And I became the latte guy. Like I was the one who was like pushing everybody out of the way so that I could learn and get good at it. And, you know, uh, six years later, I had my name on the door at that restaurant. So I, I really encourage people, if you are bad at something, you can either say, you know what, that's okay, I don't need to be good at this, or you can run headlong towards it, and that's how you become good at it. I love that so much. I, I feel so validated by that from all of the things that I've done in my life that I had, you know, quote unquote, no business doing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's great. It's it's okay to not be the best at it. It's actually a, a good thing. I, I love that embracing the kind of the discomfort and, and running towards it. That is outstanding. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And, oh, uh, and if it's all right, I just dropped into the chat a, a page from my website that has uh, the some of the particulars from the self-compassion break, is including like sample phrases and different recordings you can listen to and, and some things that some oh, folks might find helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Chrissy. That's great. Yeah, that is perfect. And we'll have that in the, the show notes as well. So people can can access that later on too, for sure. And I love that exercise. That is great. Like I, I cannot tell you how much I love tonight's episode and I am going to be using these techniques and the self-compassion breaks. I can already tell you from my exercise yesterday, I was like this, I need more of this. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. <laughs> well, you, you yeah. really helped me recognize that um, some of my own thoughts were, which I thought that were kind of done <laughs> and um now I'm, I'm like oh oh yeah i still do that oh thanks religion great and there's <laughs> but that's stuff i just have to work through and start working on and, and you brought it to mind so i appreciate that that you know because i definitely want to work on myself and become better and there's something i can discuss with my therapist next <laughs> as i go back to therapy tomorrow <laughs> yeah i mean retraining the brain takes a lifetime uh and yeah. so it's it's important to remember that uh even though you may feel like you're struggling, like religion, you know, wrecked you, that you're ruined, that everybody feels that way sometimes, you know, that that's just part of being a person. So the fact that you are working on it, that's all you can really ask from anybody. You're not the only special snowflake that yeah. feels bad about yourself. Everybody's right, special. exactly. <laughs> I love it. Well, Christy, this has been amazing and so helpful. And yeah, I'm super so excited much. about doing this. Thank you for sharing this with us. Is there anything else that you want to say about this before we move into the question and answer session? Uh, only that it is, I think it's very accessible. You know, I, I recognize uh, that therapy is not available to everybody. I recognize and understand that not everybody feels like they can meditate or have time to meditate but there are some really straightforward and simple practices here that I would very much encourage everybody to, to take a moment to check out. I love it. And I am super distracted by Helen's kitty. <laughs> Who is it? <laughs> well, I, I, since we're having feel good moments, you know, I figured Bellatrix can show off her awesome self and everybody can have a, a, a dose of oxytocin from looking at a kitty cat. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. And with that in mind, let us then move to the Q&A session. So we have amassed several questions for Christy uh, that people were putting in the chat. So Helen and I will put those to you now, if that is all right with you. All right. So the first one is fitting for a first question here. Uh, someone was wondering, where do you recommend someone get started on a mindful self-compassion journey? And I, I bet your answer might be check out that link you just shared with us. That would be a really great place to start. I do think that the uh, self-compassion break exercise is a really good introduction. Uh, but beyond that, um, I would say that... Uh, <sighs> You know, I, I, I guess I would just say that there's another page on my website that I might recommend people go to, uh, and I can uh, get that to everybody. Kara, I believe I, I sent that to you already, but it's a, a collection of different articles and TED Talks and podcasts that make for a nice introduction. Um, otherwise, I would say that uh, the work of Kristen Neff is really valuable. I mean, her book, Self-Compassion, is really powerful. Uh, recently, she put out a book called uh, fierce self-compassion, which is specifically geared towards helping women recognize some of the institutional and patriarchal issues that they struggle with on a daily basis and moving from a place of feeling broken and isolated by those things to recognizing the societal forces and working to dismantle and change them. Uh, so yeah, that's, a, that's as good a place as any. Okay, well, I will also share the other links that you shared with me earlier as well, and we'll put those in the notes too, because yeah, I agree. That was great. That was where I got one of the exercises that I was doing the other day, and I was like, wow. So um, this, this might be a, a little bit of a difficult question to ask, but somebody did ask, um, what do you do if you feel like you don't deserve self-compassion? Mm, yeah, I, I like to remind folks that 
deserve doesn't have so much of anything to do with it. You know, I, I don't want to get too distracted by this thought, but like, personally, I am a prison abolitionist. I don't really care what somebody quote did to deserve to go to prison. What I'm much more interested in is will sending them to prison make them better or worse? And will it make society better or worse? And I think in uh, for both questions, the answer is worse. So I, I would really encourage everybody to think about, okay, maybe I don't deserve love. Maybe I don't deserve whatever. Okay, so what? Is you refusing to accept that love? Does that make you a better person? Does that make your life better? Does that make you happier? Does it make the world a better place? By refusing and rejecting that love, are you helping anybody anywhere? You know, I, I know that that can be a little bit uh, overly pragmatic or, or mathematical, but I really encourage people to think in terms of, are we working towards making a better world with this or not? And I can guarantee you that when you are rejecting love, when you are uh, unwilling to accept compassion, that you're not doing anything to build up the people around you, that you're not making the world a better place. And so whether you deserve it or not, if taking it, if accepting it, if being open to it makes your life better and the lives of other people better, then let's do that because better is better, right? Yeah, yeah for sure. And I wonder too, um, because accepting love and compassion means being vulnerable. Mm. you know and you have to like those feel uh, you know and it comes with also the negative as well you know and i understand the fear but i'm from the attitude that everybody deserves love and compassion that's my kind of view on it and um and allowing that space i know it can be scary but um i haven't heard anyone say that their life got worse because they accepted love and compassion and learned right. to love love themselves like i haven't had, said, heard it, anyone go well fuck this that's what that was a bad idea <laughs> yeah the research shows us over and over that self-compassion is not self-indulgent you know that being kind to ourselves is not just about uh, you know, making ourselves feel better, it really does meaningfully contribute to us improving ourselves, us improving the way that we treat others, and us uh, improving the way that we work on global issues. I love that. Yeah, thank you, Chrissy, for answering that. I appreciate that. <laughs> Okay, so here's another one someone asked, and I'm interested in this because I also recently read this book. Someone is wondering um, what you think about healing trauma along the lines of uh, books such as The Body Keeps the Score, and how does this relate to that? And I recently read that too, and I want to hear what you have to say about it. Yeah, no, uh, Bessel van der Kolk is, uh, is very much uh, invested in, in some of these therapies that we're talking about. Um, I, it's been a minute since I have read through that. I don't remember that book offering in particular specific like therapies or, or exercises so much as just a broader understanding of how trauma operates. And so I would say that, that by recognizing the way that trauma gets stored in the body, the way that these feelings get sort of stuck for lack of a better word, uh, you can begin to understand how some of these compassion therapies operate because we're talking about being present with those uncomfortable, unpleasant emotions. I mean, going all the way back to Freud, so much of therapy is just about finding some way, somehow to stand next to an unpleasant memory or some terrible experience. These things that we have tried to bury through all of these defensive defense mechanisms, through all of these uh, metaphors and, and personal stories and all of this. So compassion is sort of the spoonful of sugar that allows us to be mindful and present with something unpleasant. So yeah, I, I do think that these two things uh, are kissing cousins. Fair enough. So um, getting, um, 
so somebody was asking, and I really wanted to hear your um, response to this, um, especially as a queer identifying person. Someone was asking, um, is there mindfulness for someone who suffers from gender dysphoria? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, in particular, like if you wanted to start with the self-compassion break, uh, you can work towards, I, I think on one of those links that I just shared was specifically a uh, like self-compassion for our bodies. Uh, using something like a compassionate body scan technique can be incredibly valuable here. So much of gender dysphoria is the idea that I am in the wrong body, that my body is not correct, that there's something wrong with me, that I was supposed to be born this way and instead I wasn't. And by taking that non judgmental type of framework, and recognizing that the body that we have is the body that we have. And if we choose to make changes or if we choose to, uh, you know, operate through these different therapies, then that's great, but that there's nothing broken about who we are to begin with. I, I, I think that this is a particularly effective therapy for folks who are struggling with uh, gender issues and really just any sort of sense of not belonging or not being correct, being isolated in that way. I love that because I feel like it kind of goes back to what you're talking about earlier, where the feeling like you're broken and that there's something wrong with you and you're the one who's uniquely not right. Mm -hmm. That came from, you know, whatever the, maybe it was religious ideology or, or something else. And this is giving yourself permission to not think about yourself under that framework. I love that. And also, too, this is just good advice for people just not feeling okay. Because, like, you know, as women, we're given messages that you have to look a certain way and mm -hmm. your body has to be a certain way. And we're very judgmental on ourselves. Like, I've, at, at my old age, at 45 years old, I've learned to just be like, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think, I think that I'm, like, I'm not saying this is an ego I've ex I, I think I'm beautiful just the way that I am but I had to teach myself that you mm -hmm. know and I think that that message that you know we're taught you know and I'm not I'm just talking as someone that doesn't have gender dysphoria and not I'm dealing with the cis I'm talking from a cis perspective but that idea idea of learning to be like you're not broken Mm -hmm. you know like your body you 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 know your body is okay you know and um and i think that message alone that you are not broken is a really important message to send to anyone yeah 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 and i feel like i want to pick up on what dr ray was saying in the chat as well about how it, it could even be a combination of not just the religious indoctrination but also this kind of capitalist narrative of you're broken and not good enough and you need to consume all of these things to fix it and consume and produce consume and produce yeah. consume and produce as opposed to just accepting uh the way things are which doesn't mean that we aren't working towards change. I mean, I, I dedicate all of us here, like we spend so much time trying to change the world for the better, but that doesn't mean that we need to stand in judgment of that world just because we have a, a preference for how things could be and for how people could be happier, safer, more comfortable, less traumatized. That doesn't mean that we need to judge the world as it is. I think we can come to a place of acceptance and say, you know what, it makes sense that the world got here. It makes sense that religion split, spread all over the planet. It makes sense that we have some of these flawed ideas. And now that we know better, we can do better. We can move towards something that we prefer. I love that. When you know better, do better. That's one mm -hmm. of my favorite mm -hmm. quotes. <laughs> yeah, me too. I love that. Okay, so I know we're getting a little low on time, but I want to ask you another question. There were a few people that had variations on the same kind of idea, so I'll read you a couple of examples of it, but there were some people who were saying in the chat that, well, I've tried meditation before under less than ideal circumstances, and it didn't go well, mm -hmm. and so, you know, how can I do this in a different way? And so two sort of examples that people gave were, one person said, 
I was involved in transcendental meditation for a while, which started off with this religious respect for the founder. And so ever since that, I still have a hard time meditating and they're wondering how they can meditate in a more kind of neutral way. Sure. And then similarly, someone else was saying, I feel anxious when I try to focus on being present. And so the idea of meditation freaks me out. Is there a way I can meditate without realizing it, like tricking myself <laughs> into it so it doesn't feel like the traditional way that it was taught to me where you have to pay attention to your breathing and it's very anxiety provoking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would definitely want to, you know, maybe have a one-on-one a -on -one conversation about what some of those triggers are and, and how to avoid them. Uh, but I, I guess I would say that this uh, the self-compassion break exercise that we've been discussing does not require a deep understanding of meditation. There, there's not going to be any insistence that you sit in a particular way on a particular cushion. You don't have to bang a gong or light any incense. And getting away from some of those particular trappings might be really useful. But also remembering that like when you go to the gym or, uh, and work out, it is okay for you to sweat right? Like it's meant to be hard. It's okay that you feel like you're struggling. Uh, you're not doing a bad job of meditating. If you are somebody who uh, like personally right now, I'm at a point in my life where about four days a week, I am running between six and seven miles. I'm running a lot. But if I was, uh, and so when I'm trying to like uh, test my limits, when I'm trying to like push myself, when I'm trying to go further, I need to go maybe eight, maybe nine miles. Somebody who is just starting off, just jumping off the couch and working towards that 5K, walking around the block is still exercise, right? Like it, mm -hmm. it, if it is uh, hard for you, if it's a struggle for you, if you are bumping up against your own competencies, your own skill set, if you are struggling at something, that means you're growing at something. So if you sit down to meditate and you feel like you're bad at it, Good. That means you're doing it right. You know, we, we interpret that idea to mean that we're somehow uh, awful. And in reality, it just means that we're getting better, that we're learning something. Fair enough. So, um, so since if you are struggling with meditating or getting started, would you recommend any books or videos that to get people started on that mindfulness journey? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I guess I, I don't mean to, to keep repeating myself on the self-compassion break. Something else that you might consider is um, like it, there was that question about sort of how to find a back door into meditation. Mm -hmm. I think the mm -hmm. best answer for that would be the work of Shauna Shapiro. Uh, she has a book called Good Morning, I Love You. Um, she also has some, I think she's got maybe a, a TED talk or at least some some really beautiful YouTube videos where she talks about how for uh, for years now, her practice has been as soon as she wakes up in the morning to just say good morning to herself. And then eventually she felt comfortable adding, I love you to that good morning. Mm -hmm. And by taking that 30 seconds every day to just express a little bit of kindness towards yourself, you begin to, again, create that neurogenesis to begin to like strengthen that neural connection. You begin to just feel more comfortable with that idea. Uh, and so I, I think a lot of her work on mindfulness might be a, a good backdoor for people who are uncomfortable with some of like the more con some of the conventions of like modern American meditation, which is really wrapped up in like some, you know, sort of borrowed Eastern traditions and, you know, can, can be problematic in a lot of ways. I love that. Just telling yourself you love love each other every morning. You love yourself every morning. Like mm -hmm. I love that. Like I I that gives me like good feelings. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good morning. I love you is a very easy read, and it's uh, it's really beautiful work. I okay, I'd recommend I'm gonna, it. I'm gonna check that out for sure. <laughs> Okay, Christy, you're adding to my book list. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to get all the way through, but I'm not going to feel bad about not getting all the way through it. <laughs> <laughs> That just means that you have it. an ambitious book list. That means right. that you're trying. Yes. If I met my Goodreads reading challenge goal every year, that would mean I wasn't pushing myself. It was too hard. low of a challenge. Yeah, exactly. Okay. 
validated. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been amazing, Christy. I mean, honestly, the, this has been great. I feel like I've taken so much away from this. I'm going to go back and rewatch this later and definitely check out some of these resources, uh, which I'm going to drop one more time in the chat here for anybody that is looking for them. We've got a couple of resource recommendations that you mentioned, as well as a couple of links to your website that people can check out to check into this further. And we'll go ahead and start wrapping up so we can get to the Hangout. And I want to remind everybody that we will be back here again next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. So don't forget to tune in. And if you don't want to wait that long, most of our previous RFRX recordings can be found on our YouTube channel, as we mentioned earlier. And I'll drop the link in there for you, as well as wherever you get your podcasts. And the podcasts get updated a little bit quicker than the YouTube does. So if you're looking for more recent ones, check the podcasts first. And if you have any questions or ideas or suggestions or anything else you want to communicate with us, go ahead and drop us an email at rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org. And if you really want to get into some more content, don't forget about the blog and the podcast. So I'm dropping those links as well. And Helen, while I do that, do you want to tell people about the social medias? Yes, so um, all of you are on social media. I know it. <laughs> so why don't you prescribe to the Facebook page? So go to, um, we have a main page for Recovering from Religion. We also have a support group page. So you can also find, so there's two things you can do. You can get info on Recovering from Religion and talk to agents and clients, and you can get support online. So go to the Facebooks, y'all. Um, we have a Twitter as long as Twitter is in existence, um, if Elon burns it to the ground, we'll find another social media to promote on. But as of right now, we are still on Twitter. So go check us out on Twitter. Um, also, um, we are on the Instagram and on the TikTok. I am not on, I am on Instagram, but I don't use it. And TikTok is this foreign land that I um, only hear about and occasionally get shared videos with. I am so, but we are on there. And um, we, if you, if you want to know what's going on, recovering from religion, how, wh how, whatever social media you use, we are there. So you should come check us out. Now, um, you can sign up for our newsletter. We are a little behind on the newsletters. Um, I'm going to be honest, but you should sign up for one. So you will get more than dick pills recommendations in your email, which, and I feel that the newsletter might be more useful. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, you will not get dick pill recommendations no, from our newsletter. Won't. No, you will not. <laughs> And if you and, do need dick pills, talk to your doctor. <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering, Helen, though, do you think if we started showing on our TikTok, like, videos of popping zits and blackheads, that would help us? Because I, I recently... Like Dr. Pimple Popper? Yeah. I got on TikTok, <laughs> and I keep getting these these videos recommended to me that it's just, like, people popping zits all the time, which is apparently a whole category of content. You know, know you it's an watch. algorithm, Kara. You're doing yeah, something to tell them that that's I'm what looking, you're looking get, for. Don't you shame videos. me, Christy. <laughs> I get cat videos and living in Florida stuff. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe I need to buy some face products. I, well, according sure. to Freud, you're sexually frustrated if you're popping pimples and stuff. So, really? Okay. And that Freud it? was definitely right on a whole bunch of psychological stuff. Totally well, right. <laughs> who am I to argue with the experts? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anyway, um, do you want to launch the next poll? Yeah, we should probably move to that so that yeah, I let's stop do that. talking. Yes, <laughs> I'm going to go to that now. So I will launch our exit poll, which is the same as it always is, which I will read now. And this helps us out a lot uh, if y'all answer this and let us know how it went for you and what kind of programming we should continue to provide. And so the questions are, number one, this program was relevant to me. And the answer choices are from one to five, with one being not at all relevant and five being very much relevant. Question number two, same answer scale. The speaker was clear and understandable, with question one being not at all understandable, up through five being very understandable. Question three is, I will definitely attend 
programs like this, with one being will not attend again, all the way up through five will definitely attend again. And finally, question four, how did you find RFRX tonight? Was it through the RFR online community or Slack community? Was it through a meetup event? Was it through Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram? Through Eventbrite or other? And I have started to notice that almost the majority of people tend to select other, and I would love to know what other is. So if you feel like letting yeah. us know in the chat what other is, please do <laughs> so that I can right. update this question. <laughs> what is this other? <laughs> yeah, what is we this need other? inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> uh, mainly of. Um, so I will leave that up for a few minutes, and I want to bring on Dr. Ray again to close us out. Dr. Ray, come on down. Okay, had a hard time getting the darn mute off. Anyway, thanks, thanks, Kara. Uh, Christy, I think you blew a few minds tonight, and I uh, hope all you folks know that you just got a, I don't know, an hour of therapy maybe <laughs> for free. <laughs> Uh, no, this is not a this is not a substitute for therapy. But I'll just say this, um, and I don't think you and I have talked about this, Christy. But I learned meditation when I was 22 years old, uh, a version of meditation. I've since learned several others, but it is a lifelong skill that I am so glad that I learned at such mm -hmm. a young age. It really helped me get through a lot of normal life problems without uh, as much suffering. So uh, I, I will just endorse pretty much everything that, that Christy has said. And uh, one thing I want to go back to, very first thing, one of the first things Christy said, I want to remind folks, because whether you like meditation or not, or use it, I don't, I don't, I mean, that's up to you. But this notion that when you meditate, you get angry at yourself for not doing it right. And I, I really like that idea, Christy, I haven't, I haven't heard it quite put this way that you're you're practicing being mad at yourself. You're not practicing meditation. Mm -hmm. Is that that's brilliant? That's a great way to see it. And I can look back when I first was learning it, I would find myself getting upset at myself for not doing it right. Well, that's you know that's kind of defeats the whole purpose. So just be aware. Uh, you want to you want to be kind to yourself and be compassionate and give yourself permission to make mistakes and permission to let your mind wander off and then gently bring it back that's that this skill is a is a lifelong skill i will i'm 72 years old i will say for me it's been a lifelong skill and i would really really recommend everybody on this planet learn learn some form uh that whatever form works best for them mm -hmm. there's so much to absorb from what uh, christy said tonight i hope you'll go back and rewatch this, go to Christie's website, find the resources. Don't let this just be another F RFRX. This has been a special one. We have damn good RFRXs. Uh, I don't want, I'm not putting them down. I think we all have, we have some of the best content on, on the web, but this tonight was the best of the best. So um, don't let it pass you by. This is an opportunity to really grab something new and, and start learning and practicing.